Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Pitch Us. Super excited to have you guys here today. We have a great entrepreneur with us uh, from Class Bubs, Christina. And then our celebrity guest is Timothy Lipton. I'm Tim Cooley. I'm the author of the Pitch Deck books. One of the reasons for this podcast is really to help people be more aware of what their presentation styles look like. Um, and what we always finish with is, would we take this uh, company to due diligence based off of what we heard. Uh, and, and a lot of times this is what happens with podcasts. I mean, not podcasts, but with um, pitches. They, they, they pitch and we don't know who they are. And then that decision gets made to move on right then and there. And so we want to expose what's really happening behind the curtain on any type of investor uh, presentation. And so Tim, please uh, introduce yourself and uh, we're excited to have you here. Thanks for having me, Tim. Uh, I'm Timothy Lipton of Momentum Finance. I run a CFO team for founders. Uh, it's a boutique uh, fractional CFO firm and looking forward to the pitch today. Awesome. Thanks for being here. And then Christina, go ahead, share your screen and then pitch us. Great. Thanks so much for having me, Tim and Tim. <laughs> I'm really excited to be here. I'm the founder and CEO of ClassBubs, an ed tech platform. So let me get right into it. So basically, the story of class clubs really began when I had my daughter back in 2018, when she was turning when she was about one years old, just right before the pandemic and the end of 2019 is when I really came up with the idea of class clubs out of my own kind of frustration and need. And after speaking to a lot of different moms with kids of different ages, we're all looking for meaningful activities and classes to do with our children and really found that the entire after school activities, extracurricular class space is super fragmented. And in every other industry and sector, there's an app or a platform that allows consumers to be able to browse and be able to get access at the click of a button. Um, anything from, you know, groceries in two hours with Amazon Fresh or, you know, Uber or Grab, one of the other um, ride sharing companies around the world. And yet there was really nothing that I could easily um, browse and, and book classes for my for my kids. So that's where the story of class books really began out of my own pain point. Um, so as I was saying, there's really no global platform that is connecting educators and children's class bookings. And this was something that I was hearing over and over again, that other parents were also juggling um, a lot of different schedules and, and wanting to find the best classes for their children. So um, that's what we're tackling here. So since beginning the journey, um, obviously 2020 with the pandemic, um, there were challenges. Uh, I was doing a lot of uh, groundwork, but really things only kicked off uh, kicked off until last year, 2021. I did a venture building program and that allowed me the opportunity to really, in a structured way, go out and speak to tons of hundreds of parents as well as educators, education businesses, and really discovered that, you know, for the parents, the pain point really is the discovery portion of finding all the different types of classes and then booking them because all the different educa educators and education businesses have various ways of booking, whether it's email or calling them. So it's all pretty manual. So back when I was thinking about my own experience and on a Sunday night wanting to schedule the rest of the week, I had to wait until Monday morning when someone was in office hours to be able to access the schedule and try to see if I could book, book a class. Um, and also at the same time, there's really no peer reviewing platform to see what other parents are saying about those classes um, and also uh, just understand what the quality of the educators are. On the educators end, too, there is a problem to be solved. And it's um, obviously, uh, first and foremost, education businesses are always looking to reach new customers, new audiences. Um, at the same time, this is kind of the one industry that is left behind where it's still very manual and what we call low tech. There's no kind of standardized um, uh, industry specific booking management system that is, um, you know, real time. So uh, some uh, software or back end system that the education businesses use that syncs to a customer facing portal that will take care of all of the, you know, class class management, you know, inventory management. So this is the problem that ClassBibs is solving. So what we're building um, is a parent platform that will obviously have a complete discovery and booking engine. 
um, that will allow parents to pay um, as well as uh, be able to review the classes. So there's a networking element. Um, and then on the on the educator side, we're, we are building a comprehensive booking SaaS platform for the educators. So what this means is that real-time class booking management tool, where as you can see um, in the calendar, it's very easy to, for them to populate all the classes they have and to update you know, however many available spots there are. Um, so this is something that we see very often in like the fitness or wellness industry. There are um, companies out there that take care of this for those types of businesses. There's no um, industry specific um, one for the kind of ancillary education space. So this is the problem that we're tackling. And of course, um, um, as we go along, you know, we really want to develop features um, in sprints, working closely with the education businesses. There will be other features that will allow them to to be able to access like analytics and you know other features like invoicing. There will definitely be a support chat, kind of like the the likes of Airbnb, where the educator or host, the customer, the parent, as well as the platform class flows will be in kind of a, a group chat and be able to support each customer through any problems that they may have in the customer journey. Um, what we're also including as part of the parent platform is our own pri proprietary holistic learning framework. And this is not a diagnostic tool. It's more kind of gamifying the whole um, learning journey for kids um, so that parents can kind of track how is my kid, what is the point of my kid doing all of these different uh, out of school extracurricular classes? It really is to explore their interests, their hobbies, develop passions and new skills um, and really develop them in a very holistic way so that, you know, it's, it's real world education, having them future ready, um, learning and being exposed to different disciplines and skills that is outside of traditional schooling. And Classbos wants to make that whole experience really fun and gamify that. So as a, as a, as a learner, a kid is um, taking classes on Classbubs, they'll, parents will be able to see like the different areas of holistic development that um, the kid is really um, going through on that learning journey. So our business model is a very simple transaction based model as our core revenue. Um, later on, we do foresee there being a recurring revenue from the SaaS, uh, the educator SaaS platform, but that definitely is a smaller portion than what we project out uh, to be from the tr basic transaction based uh, model where, you know, we're, we're earning 10 to 30% commission on each class booking. And then as the platform grows too, and there's more, data on um, on customers and their behavior and their spending, there definitely is an opportunity for the education businesses to advertise and promote their classes on class pubs and, and be more targeted and probably a much more um, a fruitful way of spending their ad dollars rather than throwing it at Google ads or, or Facebook ads, which are starting to get harder with, with the changing out constantly changing algorithms. So um, the market that we're looking at, as I said, is outside of traditional schooling. Um, what we're looking at is a, a global enrichment market that ha has a total revenue of about $200 billion. Uh, we are we incorporated and started in Singapore. So um, these figures obviously are speaking to the size of the Singapore market. Singapore, if you don't know, um, is a pretty small um, city state with about 5 million people. There's about 700,000 kids, and we're looking at um, the spend on enrichment to be 1 billion US dollars uh, in 2018. And that figure definitely has grown since 2018. So that was also one of the reasons why we wanted to uh, start in Singapore, because it's um, a market that is uh, has a lot of disposable income and parents are very much in invested in their children's um, education. So uh, this was also just to illustrate in, in one city uh, what the what the kind of bottom up um, TAM could be based on um, an average ticket size of around $150. If they're uh, doing one booking a month and we were charging 10 percent commission um, and we have 30 percent market penetration on 400,000 kids, that's about a 1.7 mil a monthly revenue potential on just the booking transactions. So. Um, this this is also relevant to the U.S. market in terms of the competition. Um, we're looking at the bait, the kind of general population. There's a lot of like ticketing sites like PTICs or Eventbrite, which also does have um, family events and 
and uh, events for children. Um, but of course, it's not only skewed towards children. And then th there are a lot of, of course, like localized um, media companies that are focused on kids specific information. So newsletters, um, you know, here in Austin, where I'm based, there's do 512, which rounds up tons of children's activities and family activities. But of course, if you ever want to book um, a class or a ticket to an event, you've got to then go figure out on whatever respective website and go do the booking and the payment. Um, before the pandemic, meetup was definitely popular and a lot of the like, especially the baby and toddler classes in a city would be um, listed there, too. That would be one platform where parents could discover those types of classes. But again, there's no payment integration. So the biggest com competitor that we have is a New York City based startup called Sawyer. Um, they've been around for uh, a couple of years, um, probably like five, six years. They're venture backed. Um, they are, we, we've scraped their data. They are very focused um, in New York City. And um, uh, there's definitely an opportunity. We see that um, competitors like Sawyer in the US tend to be very localized, whether there's one in, um, you know, startups like this, similar to Classbubs in New York City or in the Bay Area. Um, so we do find that there is this opportunity at, as like a second or third movers advantage to really be able to go and penetrate, um, you know, a lot of the major cities in the US and look at more of a you know, maybe in the beginning, we're looking at just like the Southwest region and then eventually roll out nationally. So um, that's kind of what the competitive landscape um, is like for us. So where we are now, and I'm seeing it, you know, as a, a parent with um, with a kid uh, back in Singapore, but also in Austin and now um, being um, kind of uh, really integrated to our school community and meeting other parents here. The market right now is using a mishmash of different softwares and programs and, um, you know, educators are using, you know, a Google Calendar or like Calendly for booking and um, uh, sorting out the scheduling um, newsletters like through MailChimp or, you know, various different modes of communication. And what we're really moving towards is we want to um, redefine the market and, and basically create an uh, entirely new ecosystem where it's one catch-all platform where both the education businesses, you know, on the edu edu educator side, as well as the parents are interacting and discovering and um, creating this community of learning on ClassBubs. So um, in terms of our go-to-market strategy, uh, so right now, you know, so far we haven't spent any uh, money on marketing. We want to continue having product-led growth through um, incentivizing referrals on the on the platform for parents. So, you know, making it very easy for parents to share, Let you know, let's go do this class together, um, sending inviting other parents um, and their kids to, to join them on a class, incentivizing through them through that. Uh, we also do have a, a growth strategy with, um, you know, digital marketing campaigns um, mapped out. So uh, with funding too, we would like to roll out um, our growth strategy uh, primarily on digital, on digital channels. Um, and then going back to um, not just re direct referrals within the parent community, but also subsidizing, you know, a certain number of class bookings and um, allowing for there to be group discounts. Um, as well. Um, on the educators end, we've been using a very consultative kind of BD approach where, um, you know, I go out and, you know, in Singapore, I've onboarded 150 different education businesses, uh, ranging from like dance, music, cooking, to coding, robotics, architecture for kids, and really it's just uh, reaching out, talking to them, um, showing them um, our product roadmap and like what the platform actually looks like. Uh, we have high fidelity mockups and and basically sharing with them how um, how the system will benefit them. Um, we we foresee the software to be offered for free, so there's going to be no charges for them. It's going to be free for them to to join the platform and list their classes. Um, in terms of our team, um, this is my co-founder Mike. We've been now working together for about twelve months now, so he is um, the builder. He has a very um, interesting background. He actually f uh, founded and built the first food delivery app in Sri Lanka uh, before Uber Eats went into the market. And he bootstrapped that for about five years. 
and then had a his own sort of personal form of an exit working with Glovo, the unicorn food tech company in Europe. And he was in charge of market expansion. And when he launched, for example, Kazakhstan, that was the fastest growing market um, at that time. So really, really lucky to uh, be partnered with him um, for his business acumen, but of course his technical skills. Um, he has basically assembled his our team of um, freelancers that are that are helping to build our new platform, the mark, the, our MMP, our marketable product, which we've been able to um, build kind of eighty percent of so far. Um, and what we're actually raising now is um, three hundred thousand dollars, and that is so that we can complete. Um, I mean. Um, Half of it is budgeted towards our engineering so we can complete our platform, both the uh, the educator platform and as well as the parent platform and our super admin. And then the rest is really budgeted towards um, um, hiring talent and growth. So um, with that, we would like to achieve um, product market fit um, and also kind of, and basically determine exactly what our customer acquisition costs are, drive up revenue, um, basically bookings. Uh, class bookings. And um, so far, our journey, um, before Mike came on board earlier this year, um, I was a solo founder with um, a couple of interns um, <laughs> that were helping me uh, here and there in 2021. Um, I beta launched with the proof of concept that I built. Um, just to, I'm not technical, so I kind of just put together a very ba basic website, found a uh, third party kind of booking booking engine type thing and, and linked it together. I onboarded about 30 educators and we went out to test and about two weeks later, uh, we had some organic bookings coming through, navigated all the up and down pandemic restrictions in 2021. Um, also tried to outsource um, an MVP app with a remote team in India that ended up being a complete <laughs> disaster. So learned through a lot of different trial and error um, got to a point where early this year, you know, had about 140, 150 educators that were, um, you know, agreeing to do business with us and then onboarded Mike. And that obviously changed a lot of things because it took product and tech away from me, which was amazing. And then in Q2 of this year, we raised uh, 100 grand from angel investors. Um, and uh, so this year we've really be been building product and, um, you know, ha having more class bookings. Um, but we definitely did um, uh, face a roadblock in the summertime this year when um, our uh, fundraising kind of uh, efforts sort of stalled. And so we pushed it out until now, but we still haven't been able to complete our entire platform that we set out to build this year. Um, so as of now, we're still currently raising um, 300000 so that we could complete our product and go to market with that. Um, with that, thank you so much. I hope I haven't um, taken up too much of your time, but thank you so much for the opportunity to present. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Awesome, Christina. Thank you so much. A um, couple of questions I would just want to ask before we get into like really the, the, the meat of trying to help you with this presentation. What is a bub? A bub? <laughs> It's probably more of a British or Australian slang, I would imagine. But a bub is like a little one. Okay. Okay. Because you mentioned it. In is, that the, not a, is that not something that we... Sorry? You mentioned it in the day. I didn't know what it meant. So I assumed it had a meaning, um, but I didn't know that. Okay. So I guess I guess bubs is not really something that is uh, used a whole of a lot in the States. Yeah. I didn't know. Tim, did you know? No. I, I just... No. <laughs> I mean, cool. It's not really relevant, but I just was curious. Um, great, perfect. Well, thank you again. Um, let's start off with some of the things we like. Tim, do you want to kick us off? Um, yes. So the things I really liked is the you're solving a problem for yourself, which is always um, a green flag for me when I look to founders that are uh, trying to solve a problem. That this is truly a problem that you know and you you own and you have all the insights required uh, to propose a, a good solution. Um, I really like the clean problem slides. Um, I like the, the fact that you break your solution into addressing the parents uh, and the educators, I, I think. And then you start talking about the gamification, which I think makes a ton of sense. Um, and aside would be, you know, I might spend more, more time on the parent slide because you, you, click through them. And I think the parents is probably 
the most interesting slide, especially for you're going to have more individuals that are angels that are um, that can identify with the parent side. And, and so having that really in your face is helpful. Uh, I think you have a very clear delineated business model. I'm going to follow up question on how your your alpha have, has gone. Um, I like the fact that you've done the bottom up TAM. Uh, obviously, it would be helpful to update that with the U.S. Uh, mm -hmm. I think your competition slide was very good. The fact that you have a competitor, uh, that you have at least one competitor, is actually useful because you're not the the mm -hmm. thought leader. Uh, and I'd add yep. your logo to that slide. You should be bigger than the competitor, and you should be on the yep. on the graph. Um, mm -hmm. Go to market makes sense. I mean, you know, trying to figure out if those tools uh, generate the virality you need is that's what you're trying to figure out. Um, really like the fact that you found a technical co-founder. Um, I think you get a lot of leverage associated with that. Um, and I think your ask is pretty clean. Um, it would be helpful to, to know if it's, you know, if it's a safe, you know, what's the pre-money, what's the discount, whether, you know, there's some details around that would that would be useful. And then a little bit of background on the hundred K you earned, whether it's part of this, whether it was a standalone safe. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, just because you're, we're curious and you've gone into market, uh, maybe, maybe a little bit more information on what happened when you had the 30 educators and then the, the 140 educators and then a hundred bookings per month, uh, a little bit more transparency into what were your learnings from, getting that initial engagement and, uh, mm -hmm. and that caps off oh, oh, my other, uh, my, my one question before, while I'm, you know, grappling positives is how do you qualify the educator? I mean, how do you know that this isn't, you know, some troublesome person that it's, it's truly a, a vetted person that I can trust my child with. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, one thing is, and, and this isn't really um, uh, a science to it, but I would say in terms of uh, when we were uh, when we're when we were solely operating in Singapore, um, it's highly regulated. So any any business that is incorporated in that and it's basically going out and saying that they're teaching kids, um, the Ministry of Education and it's and the and the government, um, it is very strict. Certain. Uh, standards that are met. So in that sense, in that market, we were very lucky because these educators that are in operation are kind of pre-vetted. Um, but we're definitely mindful that as we go forward, there has to be some sort of um, onboarding mechanism that um, that class clubs has that does um, do quality of quality control. But one of the reasons why the peer review, the reviews from the parents is really important is that when the when certain educators are consistently getting very low reviews, then it, it then our call to action is kind of to look at that education business or educator and see whether or not they um, they're deemed to be relevant or you know worthy of being on the platform. So we do see that you know it's kind of everyone can join. Um, obviously, you have to be a registered business, and we would do the basic checks of do they have like a website, and um, you know usually they not very good, but they have social media pages and they're already up op in operation. Obviously there are some newer players, but every one of them are registered businesses in that market. So that's kind of the vetting process that we have right now, but we definitely need to make that more robust as we, as, as we grow. Thank you. Great question. Off um, to you, Tim. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So Deco, some of the Thanks. things that Tim said, one of the things I really do like is that you do have a te technical co-founder who has a lot of experience in startups. I think that is a great find for you guys in the team. Um, mm -hmm. Overall, it was a great presentation. Uh, it was just a little long, um, but yes. you know, I, I did like that you tied it to your yourself and the problem that you have. Um, but one of the things, there's a couple of things here I think that we can help you with overall, and I'd like to mm -hmm. get into that. So um, Tim, why don't you start us off with those? I know you mentioned a couple of them, but. Oh. Yeah, so I, I think some of the questions are, you know, how do you vet folks? Because that's a big deal. You know, do you get some references? Um, what's the bar to inclusion? Um, mm -hmm. I think maybe refine the target market on the parents a little bit, because I, I noticed you said zero to 12. And I think you probably have uh, a probably a tighter target demographic. Um, so and and possibly, you know, may, maybe there's a little more focus that comes into play. 
because you know when you've when you've got something you know toddler to preschool uh to early um you know lower school kind of stuff you, i i assume there's probably a, a pretty wide dynamic um mm -hmm. of what's appropriate and what what can be done um mm -hmm. i think uh i was interested to to see that under the gamification there's uh like a child uh categorization or a growth chart associated with their classes as they take them over time and i'm curious mm -hmm. if there's some form of baseline or if you're just going to assume everybody quote unquote starts with a cute little circle in the middle and then as they take classes they start growing in in different areas yes um yeah so and I, obviously I at this point we're not tied to like what they're doing outside of what they're booking on class bubs so you know we haven't thought about that integration yet but it really was to the, for the purpose of whatever they're doing within the class bubs ecosystem yeah that sounds great all right tim back to you cool thanks yeah so a couple things is one i don't know your background what like what what's your background? oh my background mm -hmm. Sure. Sorry. I didn't uh, start with that. Um, so I actually, I, I talk about how I've kind of had, had, have had three careers so far um, and I'm not like 70 years old, um, but I have a master's in art history and I was working in, well, I started off my career in advertising in New York um, eventually. Uh, so I did in, for my bachelor's, I did art history, eventually got a master's in art history and I went back into the art industry working as an art curator so that was a time when I actually got into education at the tertiary level. So I was teaching at three of the universities in Singapore. Um, I was curating and um, writing for different art publications. So I was doing that for a number of years. Um, and then also on the side, I was um, starting to dabble into business. So um, during those curator days, um, I also imported some Korean, my, I'm originally um, Korean, I was importing some Korean artist works to Singapore and, you know, selling their works through exhibitions. Um, so I was kind of, you know, dabbling into a lot of different businesses. And then in 2018, when I had my daughter, um, that was definitely a crossroads for me. It made me kind of reevaluate a lot of different things. And I was looking for my next sort of path. Um, I was really very keen on going into business. I just felt like that was something that um, I had a big drive for and um, just having a lot more um, autonomy and kind of um, control over my life and being able to build something that is really meaningful for me. And so that's kind of how I um, segued into the whole startup world um, in 2019. Cool. Thanks for that. Yeah. So um, I think one of the key things a lot of people don't do, and this is for everybody who watches, is Give us your background and how you got to here. You told us how you came across mm -hmm. this problem, but like, we, I don't know what your mm -hmm. skill set is, right? In this, you told us about right. your technical co founder. Um, and so, mm -hmm. what we, what I, based off of what you said, now that team slide becomes incomplete, right? So, uh, who are the advisors that are in the ed, you have a background in education, right? But that would might be critical or in, uh, a marketing for a marketplace like this, right? Like it now it's kind of showing the, the holes and for the team side, mm -hmm. like I, you need to fill those holes and advisors are some of the easiest ways of doing that. Um, no one on your team is a uh, financial. Um, so like people like Tim would be a great advisor to have, you know, on this as well. So, uh, fill the holes of the team with advisors is where I'm trying to get at. Right. Second thing gotcha. is, is really try and shorten the, the, the impactful statements, even like your background, right? Mm -hmm. um, we've got about 10 minutes in a pitch, otherwise people get bored. Uh, so unfortunately, mm -hmm. that's just a true statement. So try and shrink th things like that. Um, from an overall presentation, try and increase the size of the font. So we recommend about 22 size font at a minimum, no matter what it is. And that'll help you cut out some of those extra words. Um, this was actually pretty good, easy to follow, but just as a general rule, um, look into that. Mm -hmm. um, gotcha. One thing I did not know was what an educator was. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know how you were using that. I didn't know if it was a preschool teacher or if it was like you mentioned later, uh, a person running a class, like, a, is it a piano teacher? Is it a dance teacher? You mentioned that later. And I think that would have been mm -hmm. a really, really important distinction earlier on 
because I was really yeah. lost on who you were actually selling to through most of the presentation mm -hmm. itself. Once we learned okay. about who that was, it was about 10 minutes in when I understood who you were actually selling to. Then mm -hmm. the gamification part for me didn't make any sense. If you were building a really solid backend tool for these educators, um, the gamification mm -hmm. doesn't make sense. Why do they need it, right? And again, not that it's a bad idea, not it's, it could be a game changing. I just didn't understand why they needed it, you know, or why the parents needed oh, right. it, right? Gotcha. So okay. it, it was, it's mainly for the parents, but... Um, yeah, so why do the parents yeah, need it, right? Like, um, and what, what's interesting is this, this is very similar to Mind Body, which you, you brought up, right? Just in a different mm -hmm. market. And I think, think that's actually very important to state um, because Mind Body yeah. has the same functionality, but they don't have the mm -hmm. Pinterest-like search, um, I would say, uh, drive. People don't search Mind Body for things to do, typically. They their friends yeah. tell them what to do. Right. So I think that is a, well, that's why they, they acquired class pass last year. Um, so in, in a way, like we're, we're both the mind body and the class pass play put together totally. in the education industry. And I think that's really important to bring up in your competitive, uh, landscape. Um, it, with that being said, you know, you gave that really high level $200 billion market. Uh, I think you should continue mm -hmm. the bottom up build, right? Like we're starting in Singapore, it's a potential 1.7 million. Then we're going to expand into Korea or the U S or whatever, and then build that high level 200 billion should be reflective of the same numbers that you use. Um, versus this is what every parent who has kids spends on education. Um, I don't think it builds the market the way that you're trying to do, not that it's wrong, but. Just kind of keep it all with the same mm -hmm. same math. Um, mm -hmm. Let me get here. Oh yeah, uh, Tim mentioned this terms three hundred k. I don't know if it's a safe. It included that other hundred thousand dollars. That's really important to really bring that in. And I will say, yeah. my recommendation is to end with the ask slide. Um, you kind of almost yeah. did this. You just naturally like trying to taper it off when you're like, we're looking for three hundred. Then you change the slide and then you were like, oh, and by the way, this is what we've done, right? It's like it like it kills the flow of the presentation in a lot of ways if you add slides mm -hmm. afterwards. And so uh, some reorganization, I would put the traction slide in a little earlier. As you're mm -hmm. early in this, this company, that slide tells, you know, Tim and I as investors like, oh, these people know how to build business. You know, um, I, I don't know how much money you're making from your current clients or if you are at all um, or if they're just using it. Right. Um, so bring that in a little bit earlier and then don't mm -hmm. use uh, like you have like this thank you or contact me slide. Just add that to your mm -hmm. ask slide. Uh, this is my like Tim Cooley. If I could change one thing about presentations, just end with the ask slide, okay. throw the contact information there. Um, because typically, and as you can see where maybe you can't, but your contact slide has been up for about 15 minutes. And when investors yeah. are sitting here and you've got kind of a full recap of the whole presentation on one slide, um, it really lets us remember what you're talking about, get excited, think about questions we want to ask. So I would say, mm -hmm. throw your logo on here, remind us what the whole company is doing, talk about, you know, the ask and the terms. And then you have a great, I love the way that you did this on these like KPIs that you're trying to hit over the next six months. Um, that's a beautiful way mm -hmm. to end the whole presentation. Um, I'm just kind of hitting everything because we have limited time and I want to make sure you guys go out and rock this. Um, Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So big things for me is I didn't know who the educators were. I do know other platforms that do something similar to this as far as that the, the scheduling. And I think that parent portal is key to this, right? Um, like Tim mentioned, I think we spend a little bit more time on like parents, like, first of all, educators just don't have a solid system. And then this element yeah. that parents can Pinterest themselves, things for their kids, um, I think is really, mm -hmm. really unique of a solution. Um, let me see. That's cool. That's a cool term. I, I didn't think about, you know, related to Pinterest, but you're, you're right. Yeah. Cause I mean, I, I struggle with that even as an adult, right? Like I keep trying to find something to do and, you know, I, I really struggle with it. So I think it's great. Uh, let me check out my notes real quick. 
Oh, you spent a lot of time on that market. Um, and a lot of times you just don't need to do that. If you're, if you do a bottom up approach, um, it'll get, it, it'll get you through those slides really quickly. And you did not have a forecast, um, slide. So you didn't have like, this is what our projections could look like over the next three to five years. Um, and even though we all know those are lies, uh, it's one of those feel good slides for us. Um, so mm -hmm. that's all my feedback. That was a lot, but, um, I really like the idea of what's happening here. And so with that being Thank said, uh, we'll go to the final question. And that is based off of what we heard today, uh, Tim, would you move this company on to due diligence? I would conditioned on the follow-up answers to the questions around the terms for the investment and a little bit of sense on the projections. Uh, I, I would need those for my pattern recognition to understand what it was that I was investing my time in for due diligence. Gotcha. Yep. Perfect. And I'm in the same boat. I think you, I think there's a really great idea here. I do think there's probably some traction here that we didn't get to. And so these are those elements mm -hmm. that are just missing today. And so what typically happens is, um, and this is for everyone listening, you usually have stages in uh, raising capital. You go to like a screening committee, which might be like what we're doing right now. Um, and then mm -hmm. what we'd say is like, please come back and then present to like our larger group and answering mm -hmm. the questions that we have from here to that are vital to whether or not, you know, Tim or I would say yes or no to moving forward. Um, and so I'm in the same boat. Uh, it's, it's a maybe, um, depending on what the next version looks like. Uh, but I would love mm -hmm. to hear more because I think there's some really unique, uh, things you just didn't tell us. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm really glad that this call is recorded because I can go back and listen to your feedback again. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's why we wanted to do this. We wanted to expose what actually happens on the back end. So um, mm -hmm. thank you so much for being with us. If you guys need help, please check out the pitch deck book. It goes over the process, all the elements that are really required for any kind of pitch. Um, and then it ends with that beautiful ask slide, which is my personal favorite. And if you're looking for financial um, assistance forecasting, Check out Tim, reach out to him, find him on LinkedIn. We'll have a link in the description or check out Forecaster. Uh, there's also a link in the description as well. And um, again, thank you so much for being here, Christina, and sharing class bubs with us. And we will see you all later.